in episode 8 of the drama Shogun, Toranaga's most trusted confidant and best friend, Hiromatsu, met a dramatic end through seppuku. This unexpected turn of events shocked many viewers and showcased the essence of the samurai's Bushido to the world. In this video, we will delve into Hiromatsu's intentions for committing seppuku at that moment. Additionally, from a Japanese perspective, let's examine the reasons behind the samurai's mad loyalty and why they choose to perform seppuku, all within the context of Bushido. First, let's revisit the scene where Toranaga asked his retainers to sign a surrender document. Pushed into a corner by the opposing elder Ishido and realizing there was no chance of victory, Toranaga acknowledged the need to surrender to them and communicated this to his retainers. In the final scene of episode 8, he gathered his retainers in a room to sign the letter of surrender. While some of the retainers refused to sign, Toranaga insisted it was for the survival of Japan. Hearing this, Hiromatsu, Toranaga's most trusted confidant, declared, If my lord does not change his mind, I will perform seppuku right here. The two argued vehemently, yet there was also a silent exchange of glances between them. Sensing something, Hiromatsu decided to entrust everything to Toranaga, bowed his head, and said, This is farewell in this life. He called his son Buntaro and left him with the words, Never abandon our lord even if it seems that the Lord has taken his own life, and then committed seppuku on the spot. During this moment, there was a profound silent exchange of glances between him and Toranaga. As you can see, Hiromatsu, who had a special bond with Toranaga, silently realized that Toranaga had not given up and sacrificed himself by committing seppuku. His seppuku was aimed not only to deceive any possible spies of Ishido who might have been present, but also to trick the allies there into truly believing that Toranaga was fully prepared to surrender. In addition to convincing the Osaka side of their surrender, Hiromatsu's public seppuku served multiple strategic purposes particularly influencing four key individuals, Yabushige, Anjin, Buntaro, and Mariko. Each of these characters received a distinct message through the act of seppuku. First, concerning Yabushige and Anjin, Toranaga commented that these two are predictable in their actions. Anjin, who had been appointed Hatamoto by Toranaga, had been pleading to return home with his companions and was surprisingly granted his freedom. When Anjin finally reunited with his crew, he found them degraded by drunkenness and debauchery. Though he had longed to see his comrades, their deplorable state led him to sever ties with them. Moreover, Seeing his lord showing signs of weakness, he also lost faith in Toranaga and found himself adrift. Consequently, he sought out Yabushige, known for his typical samurai behavior. However, this series of events seems to have been orchestrated by Toranaga. He had generously rewarded the sailors enough to indulge in all the town's liquor, corrupting their lifestyle to induce disillusionment in Anjin, who had faced hardships since arriving in Japan. Historically, the figure upon whom Toranaga is based, Tokugawa Ieyasu, did provide significant compensation to Anjin's fellow sailors. This intricate web of manipulation and strategy 
highlights how Hiramatsu Seppuku was not just a personal act of loyalty, but a calculated move to influence the narrative and actions of key individuals within the story. Yabushige, known for his skepticism, was led to believe in Toranaga's surrender completely when Hiromatsu demonstrated his own seppuku. This was a deliberate strategy to send Yabushige to Osaka as showing him death was the most effective way to convince him, given his strong preoccupation with mortality. Yabushige had a history of being fascinated with death, whether imposing boiling punishments on Anjin's associates, attempting seppuku himself at the bottom of a cliff, or frequently writing his will. His interest in human mortality was notably intense. Despite his readiness to die, he wished to live and fulfill his ambitions. For Mariko, Witnessing Hiromatsu's seppuku was intended to clarify her loyalty to her lord. Mariko served Toranaga, but she was also a Christian and had special feelings for Anjin. Even at this critical moment, her resolve was unsteady, and Toranaga needed to confirm her intentions. In episode 7, there is a moment where he confronts her, asking, where does your heart lie? As a result of this event, she ultimately resolved to go to Osaka. Just before his seppuku, Hiromatsu told his son Buntaro, Devote yourself to your lord. After Hiromatsu offered to commit seppuku, Buntaro wanted to follow him in death, but this was not permitted by Hiromatsu. Instead, Hiromatsu entrusted Buntaro with the responsibility of supporting Toranaga in his place. At the same time, he taught Buntaro, who forces his own wife to live, the harshness of living through suffering. The scene where Toranaga gathered his retainers and had them sign the surrender documents, beautifully yet insanely, exemplifies Japanese Bushiro. Observing that scene closely, there were those who adamantly opposed, those who lacked loyalty from the beginning, and those who, from a heart of loyalty, resolved to sign. Many viewers might think, if there is loyalty, shouldn't everyone share the fate with their lord? Indeed, Hiromatsu, a retainer deeply connected to Tornanaga, committed seppuku in defiance of him. Such actions are indeed backed by the essence of loyalty in Bushiro. Bushiro encompasses seven virtues. Among these, one is chugi. While loyalty is the English translation, the nuance is slightly different. The term chugi consists of the kanji for chu and Gi. Understanding the original meaning of Chugi comes from comprehending these two characters. The term Chu straightforwardly represents loyalty to one's lord, corresponding to the English concept of loyalty. Gi, another virtue of Bushido, means doing what is right and includes the idea of acting without consideration for personal loss. Gi is foundational in Bushido and motivates a samurai's life. Therefore, Chu Gi, combining these ideas, means devoting oneself to right actions with sincerity and does not imply absolute obedience to a lord. It includes risking one's life to remonstrate against the Lord's errors. This value is echoed in the samurai maxim. An honest counsel is more valuable than leading the first charge. Highlighting the importance and difficulty of remonstration. For a samurai, chugi signifies loyalty based on justice, not blind faith. 
Nitobe Inazo, the author of Bushido, emphasized that the most important virtues for a samurai are righteousness and courage. Those who maintain justice steadfastly are true samurai. He also noted that the ultimate goal for a samurai is to achieve honor through maintaining loyalty, suggesting that for a samurai, chugi is not an externally imposed duty, but a form of self-actualization. Hiromatsu's actions exemplify this concept of Bushido. Other retainers who opposed Toronaga at that moment were not lacking loyalty. Rather, they were fulfilling their duty of chugi by risking their lives to offer him sincere advice. One of the virtues of Bushido is meiyo, which translates to honor. It is not an exaggeration to say that for a samurai, this is more crucial than life itself. As observed in Hiromatsu's seppuku and Tadayoshi's seppuku in the first episode, samurai must take responsibility for their declarations, even at the risk of their lives. This insistence often borders on madness due to the strength of their commitment. This concept of honor underlies their actions. Typically, honorable living might be linked to gaining societal recognition or achieving notable successes. But in Bushido, honor carries a more everyday and fundamental significance. The character for Meiyo reflects how samurai valued their name above all, as it directly denotes familial lineage and territorial rights. Achieving renown on the battlefield directly enhances the weight and value of one's name. Moreover, a samurai's honor is tied to their actions, not bringing shame upon their name. This concept is deeply rooted in Japan's culture of shame, where living without bringing shame upon oneself in the eyes of others is critical. The foundational aspect of honor is the awareness of shame, meaning that traditional Japanese behavior heavily relies on the perception of others. Knowing what shame means, Samurai strived to live lives that would not bring shame upon themselves, thus leading honorable lives. In samurai households, phrases like, do not do shameful things in public, and you'll be laughed at if you do such things, resonated deeply even within children. These admonitions are still frequently used in Japanese parental guidance today. In Shogun, various samurai, including Hiromatsu and even Yabushige, who lacked loyalty to their lord, attempted seppuku. We have discussed the loyalty and honor of samurai, but why do Japanese samurai cut their own bellies in the first place? Seppuku has a long and ancient history in Japan. There are various theories about who was the first to perform seppuku, but it is said that the first seppuku was performed in 988 by a thief. He was exposed for committing robbery and arrested. Later, he drew a sword and cut his belly while in prison. Like Buntaro and the young Toranaga did, seppuku usually involves a kaishakunin, an assistant to decapitate the samurai to release them quickly from agony. However, when that thief committed seppuku, there was no kaishakunin present, so he did not die immediately, but expired the following day. This is considered the first case of seppuku in Japan. Initially, seppuku was not performed for honor, but existed as a method of suicide. 
Over time, the concept of seppuku evolved significantly. A major turning point came during the Sengoku period in a battle of 1582. This battle, known for Toyotomi Hideyoshi's siege of Bichu Takamasu Castle using a water siege, was pivotal. Hideyoshi, referred to as Taiko in Shogun, breached a nearby river to cut off the enemy's supply routes. With victory imminent, Hideyoshi demanded the life of the castle lord. The lord, prepared to give his life, gracefully accepted. He floated a boat on the pond created by the water siege, danced a mai dance, recited his farewell poem, and then committed seppuku with dignity. This act led to the castle's surrender, saving the lives of his retainers. Hideyoshi, impressed by the Lord's conduct and the ritual of his seppuku, honored him. From then on, seppuku became widely recognized as a courageous and honorable act, not just a demonstration of martial prowess. This event and others where enemies were allowed to commit seppuku instead of being beheaded became legendary. Conversely, commoners were usually subjected to crucifixion or beheading as forms of execution, emphasizing that seppuku was a means for samurai to maintain their dignity and restore their honor. In Bushido, the act of seppuku is explained with the belief that the human belly is the abode of the soul and affections, making the opening of the abdomen a demonstration of sincerity and innocence. A person does not die immediately from cutting their belly. Left alone, they would suffer a prolonged, agonizing death over a day. This is why the practice of kaishaku, an act of mercy, became essential. A kaishaku stands behind or to the left of the one performing seppuku and decapitates them swiftly after the cut to shorten their suffering. This role was not only an honor, but also meant to prevent a dishonorable appearance, requiring a skilled swordsman with a strong mental discipline due to the difficulty of ensuring a quick, clean cut. In Shogun, a young Toranaga is portrayed struggling multiple times as a kaishaku, while Buntaro succeeds with one stroke, indicating his superior swordsmanship skills. The scene where Hiromatsu performs seppuku is shocking, yet effectively captures various elements of the samurai spirit, depicting the samurai of the time with great authenticity. We hope you enjoyed this exploration into the world of Japanese swords. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more exciting content about the history of Japanese swords. Until next time, sayonara.